from everyone. So the 51st episode on Game of Thrones. Yes. We are going to follow the footstep of the woman with the alabaster box. Amen. Today. So let's Thank prepare ourselves with, with all the things that we have our best. Mm. Just like Paul. Mm. All the best of us that will mm. throw it at his feet. Mm. Our utmost for his highest, our highest yes, for Lord. his utmost. Yes, Lord. Lord, we have come withholding nothing to Not come. everything. Things that we also bear that with we us, Lord. Those that all become about. our privileges and advantages for us. Where we find security, where we find comfort. Our safe deposits. Where we find solace. Lord, we have come. We hand over that space it. in our life to you. For you, Lord. That, Lord, pour it on you. We say our emphatically, like a poor with all confidence, you are our light, we have come. you are our salvation, we have come and we have come in you are our security, of ourselves first to the Lord. you are our shelter, and with all you are our comfort, have, you are our Lord, defense, come to Lord, you are our fortification, you. You gave it to us in the first Lord, you are our portion. Our inheritance. Lord, we are here with you. Where we find we hope, where we find life, where we find we strength. We nothing coming to you. We withdraw all those things from the hands of money, the hands of uh, human approval, from the hands of uh, this is our, our own resources, post, no. from the hands of our own uh, you know, ability, to from our own strength. And we say, Lord, we to the Lord. give that prerogative only to you in to our lives. Lord, our aspiration you are all in all. You are everything. Lord, you are the joy. You are the foundation of our joy. You, you are the bottom line of our satisfaction. You There's are the bottom line for our completion. We know that because we the scripture says that you have been made complete in him who is the head of principalities and powers. Lord, we say we and we are acknowledge like today us, in the name of Jesus not ourselves. that you have become we are not our completion. No institution, no nation, no in you, we us, lack no, no good thing. So we say like David, the shepherd the boy, pastor, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I will not want you, anything. Lord. I'm lacking nothing. So we there is nothing missing. There is nothing broken because we are in you and you are in us and you are all we need and all that we have. Lord, we have come to Thank you, Jesus. Everything. For you have become your peace, everything you have come to, to us. Bow today and always. Hallelujah. Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We have come to read ourselves. For Christ is made unto Lord. us the wisdom and the power fully of God. You are Lord. made unto us all that we need, all that we desire. You are made Thank unto you, us Lord. all that we pursue. You are made unto us all that we need for life and godliness. You are Thank made you. unto us all that matters to life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we declare right now in Jesus' name as these words and this transmission begin to go forth. Amen. That as many as will be under the weight and the glory of this exhortation, Amen. Uh, that you will begin to unveil yourself as the completion that we desire. Amen. The hope that we seek for, yes, uh, that satisfaction that we are pursuing, that completion that we are chasing after, Lord, that will find it in you Amen. through the words that are being conveyed in this transmission in the name of Jesus. Amen. Because I, according to the scriptures in John chapter 6, he said we know that the flesh doesn't profit anything. Yes. It is the spirit that can impart life. Life is all that is needed. And he said the words I speak to you, they are the ones that convey that spirit, spirit the dimension me. of the spirit, and the one that convey, convey the dimension life. of life. So right now, let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our mouth right now convey life. Amen. Not just convey instructions, but convey life. Amen. Not just convey set of rules, but convey life. Amen. In the name of Jesus, that the dead will hear the voice of the Son of Man right now. Amen. And as many that are dead, they would live. Those Amen. many that are slumbering, they would live. Those that are under the stupor of this yeah. world system, who have been stupefied, who have been dumbed down by the spirit of this age, right now will receive a resurrection. They Amen. will receive a reinvigoration. Amen. They will be jacked back to life. Amen. Through the communication in this transmission. Amen. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah, so we welcome you onto this uh, another episode of Games of Thrones. Yeah. And then we'll begin to look at the word of life. Don't forget that where we stopped in our last transmission, 
was we're going to look at, uh, you know, 1 Samuel chapter 1, uh, you know, in a place where Hannah began to say that the reason why she's able to give everything back to the Lord, he said, this child, I'm giving him back to the Lord. He said, therefore, I'm giving him back to the Lord. And when she said, therefore, that raised our interest to see if it's therefore, it means she was insinuating that something propelled her, something yeah. pushed her to be able to do what she did. And we went back to verse 27 of 1 Samuel chapter 1. And what pushed her was where it said, and the Lord gave her this word, this child. So it was the giving of the Lord that propelled her, that pushed her to be able to release. Yeah. And uh, we came to that conclusion that what she was doing right there was preaching the gospel. That is the essence of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Don't forget the scripture said concerning Abraham. That Abraham has nowhere to boast before the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If everything that Abraham experienced and walked in was because it was the Lord that was paying him his dues, yeah. he said Abraham would have had every room to boast. Yeah. But he said, alas, there's no place for boasting with Abraham uh, because uh, all Abraham was able to do all he was able to walk in was just in response to the giving of a benevolent God. Yeah. So his life was a life full of responses. And for a believer in Christ Jesus, your life should be a life full of responses to the Lord. Yeah. Not actions, but responses. We must be a responder. Yeah. And that's what, what we looked at in our last verse. If you're not a responder to the gospel and you are an actor, your life will be full of compulsion. Hmm. You will do things out of necessity, yeah. even things that you will call sacrifice. You have to put a lot of pressure on your will. And when you put a lot of pressure on your will, after some time, you get tired. That's the implication. You get yeah. tired. That's why Jesus then said, come unto me, all ye that labor and yeah, are heaven ever laden, and I give you rest. There's something about coming to Christ that we understand that allows us to begin to effortlessly change. That's the word, effortlessly change. Most people don't think those two words can go together in one sentence. You can change effortlessly. effortlessly. Uh, that is all comes when you come into Christ. It's rest. We are changing, but we are only changed because we see him. He said, and we all with unveiled faces are being yeah. metamorphosed, are being transformed from one glory to what? To another. another. Even as by the glory of the Lord, as we behold with unveiled what? Faces. Face. That's, all, that's effortless change. We are changing, but yet it's not coming with pressure. We are changing, it's not coming under compulsion. We are changed as we see. So what we are doing by the grace of God is to begin to paint this and begin to bring the illumination so that we can see. It means the more we see, the more we can be changed effortlessly. And the less we see, the more we will need to go through change under our compulsion and necessity. And if are you are struggling with anything at the moment in your life, struggling with an habit, with a choice, struggling with a particular lifestyle, struggling struggling to break free from a particular mode. You want to listen to this transmission? Because that now led us to the woman with the alabaster box in Luke chapter 7 to see how she was able to respond as well, or how Jesus was able to uh, help us to look at our response as a key. And Jesus did say one thing, which was where we stopped. In our last transmission, Jesus did say, wherever the gospel has been preached, yeah. what this woman did, shall be brought up as a memorial. And then we came to that conclusion that Jesus wasn't necessarily saying that this woman was be the topic of every sermon or the topic of every Bible study. That would be quite uh, pointless because we know that Jesus is supposed to be the topic of every sermon. Yeah, he's the thing, he's the <laughs> because thing. Apostle Paul said, when I came among you, I came to know nothing yes. except Jesus and him crucified. crucified. Jesus wasn't elevating this woman to a status where she becomes the topic of every sermon. Because Jesus is the topic of every sermon. Yeah. But the, what Jesus was highlighting would have to be that whatever this woman did, the underlying principle of it, the concept of it, the idea of it should be what underpins every sermon. And that's what now made us say, you know what, if that's the case, if that's serious, why are we not understudying this event so we can draw the implication for our own lives? And that's why I welcome you as we go back to Luke chapter 7. I will begin to unveil and, you know, uh, the, this episode. You want to say one or two? Things? Yeah, just what you said. I just want to remind our audience again about that key word that you said that we are responders. Mm -hmm. and that we should never, never forget that. Mm -hmm. And all through the life and the confessions of our father Abraham, mm -hmm. he was always saying, I'm a Syrian, ready 
to perish. Before the Lord snatched. Yes, because yeah. the Lord snatched. So it was just a reminder yeah. and always remembering that. Don't and ever we forget see that. it all over the scripture. So the Lord reminding us mm-hmm. that we are not the initiators. We are not no. the hearters. We are responding. I did. You did not choose me. I chose. That's what's echoed or chose. I chose you. Mm-hmm. you. I love you first. You know, that is the thing. That's the running thing. So we should never, never get ahead of ourselves. Mm-hmm. We should not put the cat before the horse. We are. Mm-hmm. We should always stay as a responder. Always mm-hmm. as a responder. Because people, some people started as a responder before they become uh, actors. Actors. Now. They we'll become initiators now. So really, they can, they can, they can bring themselves. They know so much now. They know what to do. They know all the formula to bring mm-hmm. themselves to a level, to a new season. Mm-hmm. They can open it so then they become actors and indicators. Mm-hmm. We should always stay as responders. We'll respond yeah. in faith. Yes, thank you. You know, there's this, before we go back to Luke 7, there's this temptation that lies among, at least some of us, I put us, which means ourselves inclusive. There's this temptation that it is quite easy to fall into, especially if you have a teaching grace, uh, because there is always a tendency uh, to hew out formulas out of uh, you know the working with God and uh, producing results. When I say producing results, I mean a life in which we are producing fruit. It means we are taking hold of God's word, what it says exercising ourselves in God's word and getting the benefit of exercising ourselves. I don't think it really applies to teachers, even prophetic ministry yeah, yeah. and all that. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It does apply. Uh, but at least people that are able to uh, look at God's word and say, this is yes. a rule, this the is a principle. The also can use some of the manifestations. Ah, can. So, well, in that yes, way, so they, he got a formula. He got a formula. There's always a tendency to, to you know, he had a formula out of the word of God and say, you know what? Uh, God's word says, if you do this, this would happen to you. Of course, there were so many teachings of Jesus where he did say, you do this and that happens, you do this and that happens. And then we latch on to that and we do it and we see the results and then we come out boldly and say, you know what, guys, if you're not experiencing this result, it's because you're foolish enough not to know what the word of God says and all of that. There's a tendency to fall into that ditch, not knowing fully that even if you're able to understand the principles and walk in it, it is still at the mercy of the Lord. Mm. It is still the grace of God that brought you into that life. It is still mercy that will handhold you all the way. You must never get to a point where we say we begin to take pride in the rightness of our doctrines and pride in the rightness of our belief. Uh, We should be like what Jesus did say, that even if after you have done all that you should, you still, still have to say, we are just merely unprofitable servants. Servant. We have just done what we should do. Yeah. We, we must hold every truth in that perspective. And the reason why you must be humble to hold those truths in that perspective, I'll tell you the reason. Because there are maybe others who are holding the same truth. Yes, there may be others who are holding the same kind of truth and yet getting counter results. Be humble now. And there are maybe those people who are not even holding those truths as they should, but inadvertently are getting benefits. So he said, be humble now, humble yourself under the mighty arm of God, so that even when you hold a, a truth which is evident, you must still acknowledge the mercy of God, the goodness of God, that it is not just the truth that you hold to be true, that is the result of what is happening in your life. I say, Lord, I'm still at your mercy, even though I have held this truth and I live by this truth. Ultimately, I am dependent on your mercy and your favor to pull me through. Now, the, the, the challenge for us is this. This is the challenge which we have to deal with every day is those who hold the truth to be evident and walk by the truth of God's word uh, are people who struggle to throw themselves on the mercy of God. So being able to throw ourselves on God's mercy and at the same time walk in the truth that we have received is the balance we have to deal with on a daily basis. There are those people that don't care about the truth. They don't even want to listen to teachings that tells them this is what is the mind of God that you should walk. And all that we're asking for is Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. That's not what God has called us into. We're not even talking about that. We are saying that we leave off the mercy of God, the consciousness of his mercy every day and at the same time hold to this truth of the word of God. This is what God has called us into. Uh, you know, that's what we must never lose sight of as we go back into the world. Now, uh, Luke chapter 7, we're just going back 
uh, to this case of this woman, uh, verse 30, uh, I think we began to look at verse 36. Um, Luke 7, verse 36. Don't forget, we've given you the motivation for why you should be keen on this kind of discourse because Jesus said, wherever the gospel is preached, this must be outlined. Luke 7, 36. Can you read that, please? And one of the Pharisees has came to eat with him. Mm -hmm. And they went to the Pharisee's house okay. and sat down to eat. Now, well, what we promised you to do in our last episode was to look at the background and the settings of this particular event in the scriptures. The reason why we need to look at that is you have to know where everybody is coming from so that you would know the reason why they said what they said later on. So we need to get the settings right, the background right, the characters, we need to put them in context so that we can glean and gain understanding as the Lord will want us to. What it says in verse 36 is that Jesus was invited by what? A Pharisee. Pharisee. That should ring a bell to you because if it doesn't ring a bell, it means you're not paying attention because Pharisees are not the people that are on great friendly terms with Jesus. You know that. You know that. There are very, very few instances that we saw Jesus come close up with Pharisees in, in a friendly way. An example was John 3, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus at night. That was quite unusual. You know, in Matthew 23, Jesus spoke a lot of woes to the Pharisees. You know, all through the gospel, it was woe unto them because of their practices, because of their hypocrisy, because they tried to paint a picture to people and live a different life altogether. Because they try to shun the grace of God and base their life off the works of self-righteousness. Because they claim to Jesus in John chapter 8 that they can see when they are blind that they couldn't what? They couldn't see. They are the ones that always tell Jesus, we have Abraham as our father. Who are you? We don't need you. So there's a level of self-righteousness, self-reliance, self-dependency, which was completely antithetical to the gospel that the Pharisees would display. It wasn't just one Pharisee. It was common with their sect. So if you see any Pharisee, then come close up to Jesus in a friendly manner. Pay attention. Yeah. Pay attention. And that is not what their group does. That's not what they stand for. You're going to pay attention. That's why Nicodemus caught our attention. Yeah. He did something unusual for the group. Now, here we have a second instance in the scripture mentioning not a just a Jew, a Pharisee. This guy, this man belonged to that group belong to that sect. If you then see him invite Jesus to his house, I want to know why. I want to know the basis. I want to know on what basis. What was he looking for? Even Nicodemus, as much as we, in a way, praise him <laughs> for going to meet Jesus, he had to do it in the cover of the night because he knew what his other members, his other colleagues were going to say. He knew they were going to lash out at him the next day so because of that, Nicodemus had to use the cover of the night to have his questions what answered. He wasn't ready to face the music with the other what Pharisees. So this guy, Simon, why on earth will he throw away every form of restraint, whatever the backlash may be from other what Pharisees, and invite Jesus into his house? I want to find out. Because, uh, because he was going to probably face a lot. He was going to have to deal with the Lord, with the other, what, other Pharisees, because I don't see how he's going to make this secret. It was easier for Nicodemus at night to go to meet Jesus in a secluded place, but this is supposed to be a party. This is supposed to be a dinner. This is supposed to be uh, something. I doubt if this was done in the middle of the night, because you're supposed to be in bed. If it was middle of the night, this was, you know, a normal dinner going on. Yeah, so so this, they, they even have other party guests, other guests. witnesses. And this, I would like to stress that there's always a cost for associating <laughs> with Jesus. It's always there's a, some will suffer a reputational damage. Of course. However, we we'll see those, we we'll see the apostles when Jesus was on the way to the cross and say, mm. yes, we, we guess him, we know you, you are mm. one of them. So there's always a cost. Mm. Mm. There's always a cost to following the Lord, following the Lord as He ought to be, even for us. Yes. There's always a cost for associating with the Lord, for believing in the Lord as He ought to believe. Mm -hmm. And so, so many people will have a Nicodemus experience of let us do it halfway. Let's yeah. use the cover of the darkness to do some things and then show our alliance, affiliation now. They just want to show alliance. Mm -hmm. They're not fo following the Lord fully. Let's show alliance, let's show affiliation. We just say we know, mm. you know, just an acquaintance with the Lord. Mm. 
So there's always a cost, and we must be prepared. And kids are always even, if they not sugar coated, if they say there's a cost to following me, can you drink this cup? You mm. have to carry your cost. Mm. Mm. Ca carry your cross. Mm. Thank you for that um, uh, input right there. So we want to find out why we lay down the consequences with yeah. the other parties. You know, there's a tendency to praise him for this initiative for saying, wow, he's done something quite unusual. But obviously Jesus did mention that uh, because the reason why I'm interested in the response of Jesus to this invitation was the fact that Jesus was always, in most cases, uh, commending people that show unusual resolve. You know, for example, the, the centurion that asked Jesus, he was a Roman centurion, asked Jesus to come and to send the word only and not to bother to come. You know, Jesus commended such a great faith, not yeah. found in Israel. The Saphonician woman in Matthew chapter 15, Jesus commended the level of her faith when she said she was willing even as a dog to eat the crumbs on the master's table. So we always see Jesus in the habit of commending great resource, great faith, yeah. uh, you know, but he didn't seem to say anything much about this Pharisee yeah. who was willing to damn the consequences inviting him. So we were, so that should set you think, could it be something that motivated or propelled or pushed this Simon to do this, something that was quite outrageous. We call it outrageous. Now, we began to cite the scripture. Now, the reason why we're doing this is not because we want to do it for an academic exercise. The reason for that is it has implication for your Christian work. If you understand the background, the setting, where it was coming from, you now begin to understand what he was saying later on about this woman, what Simon was saying. So let's look at Mark uh, 14 and Matthew 26. Okay, we're leaving Luke 7 now. We're Luke, Luke 7 to see where was this Simon coming from? Mark, right? Yeah, Mark 14. We, we can look at that. We can also look at Luke 26. So the reason, first. yeah, okay. uh, Mark 14, you want to look at from verse 3. But the reason why it's important to look at that, this is Mark's account of the same event. event. So then Mark was able to document something that Luke glossed over. And that could give us a background to this Simon. Now, what is Mark 14 verse, from verse 3, please? And being in Bethany, okay. at the house of Simon the leper. Fusta, that's it. That's it. Uh, Mark 14 verse 3 gave us an insight which Luke told us his name. Because Simon. Jesus, Simon, I have something to say to you. But Mark 14 from verse 3 introduced us to something he was known by. Because Mark 14 will later tell you that Jesus was at the feast in the house of Simon the leper. the leper. Now, what we know by the law of Moses is the fact that if you were a leper, you couldn't appear or be in the city. You couldn't be in the town. You have to be at the outskirts of the town. Mm -hmm. The only time you could appear in the city is when you have been cleansed of your leprosy and you have to be certified yeah, by, the, yeah, by, by the, the priest who says you are now okay. That's if you notice the 10 lepers who met Jesus. It was at the outskirts of the town. They met Jesus before Jesus told them to go and show themselves to the priest. They were at the outskirts of the town. It was the law. Nobody yeah, could dare violate the, the law. Even if you were a Pharisee and you caught leprosy, you would have to adhere to the rules. You have to go. Because it was contagious, it was infectious. That was a rule concerning leprosy. Now, Matthew 26 says the same thing. We don't need to go for that. Mark 14 re-echoes it, that this Simon had an identity, was the leper. Now, we know definitely by all stretch of evidence, he wasn't still a leper. Now, the reason why we said that is because you're not allowed to be within the city. And it is not uncommon in the scripture to call people by names with a condition they had before. Now, the reason why that happens in the scripture is because we can identify the difference between men and women. So because somebody is called by a name of an ailment or a malady at the moment doesn't mean they still have it. What are the evidences? For example, look at Mary Magdalene. You know, at the time that she, another woman, you know, uh, you know, the daughter yes, of Cusa, they Jesus. were ministering to Jesus. The Bible said this was Mary Magdalene, of whom Jesus cast out, what, seven devils. Mm -hmm. It didn't mean she was still demonized. He was just using that to help us identify that it's Mary Magdalene is not the same thing as Mary, the other one. So it, we, it's okay in the scripture to use a condition that somebody had prior as a way to help us, what, identify 
who it was. You look at Hebrews chapter 11, even in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11, the Hall of Fame of Faith. When was going to talk about Rahab? Uh, probably so that we don't get it mixed up with other Rahab. He said Rahab the Harlot, but that was in the past. But he was saying that, not because he was saying that uh, she was still an Harlot, because we know that she became the great grandmother of David. Yeah. We know that because of her faith in the God of Israel, she was completely changed, recreated, retransformed, and brought into the Hall of Fame, the line lady of Jesus. She was not always the alert anymore. But when Hebrews 11 was going to tell us so that we don't mix it up, yeah. it said Rahab the alert. Yeah. So it is not unusual in the scriptures to use a condition, a negative situation that somebody had prior to their transformation to help us identify who they were referring to. So in that same understanding, Simon the leper was mentioned right here Necessarily, not because, not necessarily because he was still leprous, but so that we can understand that he was talking about the Simon who was leprous because he couldn't be within the city, within the town, hosting a party if he was still what? Leprous. Okay. Now, that being said, now the reason why we went to all of that is to show you that we can stretch our imagination to say that most likely he was healed of leprosy by Jesus. Now, it's a stretch of the imagination. Why did we say that? The reason would have to be if he was willing to go out on a limb to invite Jesus <laughs> to his own house, to his own party, and damn every what? Consequences. He must have had an encounter with Jesus that he was willing to say, I damn every Pharisee consequence. I'm going to bring this man into my house for a party. So there's every possibility right there. But what we know okay i might <laughs> want to postulate that maybe even if he was not if he was not healed by jesus i want to think that because of the experience that he had he had, yeah. suffer, uh, he had experienced isolation and rejection what could be worse he had experienced <laughs> yeah. that a part of his life okay, that's another way to think uh, about yeah what could have been and every of those things he, he had been, been ostracized, ostracized before. and every of those things wow wow that was, so he has experienced that in the life that's something that it can be positive that can come out of the negative. Negative. Wow. So really, so it wow. can damn the consequence at this point. It doesn't what care. What is there to save? What is there to spare? What has it not experienced before? And mm. that's some of the things that can make some people resist mm. their response and reaction. Because we are responders, as mm. we are responders, but we respond in different degree and, uh, 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 and variety. Mm. See, mm. we are called to all be responders. Even wow. there was a woman there that was responding. Pouring the lava pastor bus now. Mm. So how do people respond and pouring their hall, breaking their bus and some do not? Wow. So how do we respond different differently? Some based from their experience, where they have recovered where they are coming from. from. Mm. So this was somebody that has experienced the man and their nation isolation. Mm. So really there, I don't think there's anything what to lose, or anything more for, wow. for, for, for him. Wow. So I wow. think that this, was what could have that in fact, all we can do is, you know. Look at possibilities. But uh, if I was going to come to what you were saying, but thank you that you actually highlighted it, and that's very powerful. You know, that thing you just said right now, at least we can hold on to that and say, definitely he had gone through all. He has been ostracized. He has yeah. been cast out at the outskirts of the city. Now, uh, you know, he's back. He was healed by, by whatever means. Either he was healed by some other procedure or whether it was the miracle that he encountered with what? Jesus. What we know he was. He was a leper. Yeah. And he experienced all the being maligned, ostracized. Yeah. Now he's back. It seems that he's changed his whole paradigm. Yes. His whole outlook. That's what we see. Even though you would notice that when once he's back, what we don't know again is whether he was a Pharisee before he encountered the word leprosy or maybe later he was exalted to the place of a Pharisee after he was restored. We don't know that. Even though Luke 7 seems to be focused on his Pharisee uh, status, status uh, Mark 14 and Matthew 26 highlighted the fact that he used to have a condition. Yeah. So, whichever way you look at it, we are beginning to paint a picture of where Simon was coming from. Now, the reason why you need to get that picture is for you to give full understanding of the event. So, that's one thing you understand. He was the leper. And it has to be that he was the leper. He couldn't still be the leper. He was the leper. Now he invited what? Jesus, uh, you know, into his house. 
uh, willing to damn every consequence uh, because of he has experienced worse uh, being ostracized because of his what of his condition. That's what we see right there. Yeah. Now it's in Luke chapter. Now let's go back to Luke. The reason why we just read that is just for us to understand. Now I wanted to read one more thing about that Mark 14 okay. before we go back to Luke 7. We have to take this slowly because the Lord is taking us somewhere. At the Mark 14, uh, what verse did you just read? Three. Verse 3. Can you go on to verse 4, please? Okay, we have to read it because uh, it's all, all of us three, yeah, yeah. And being better now, the house of Simon the leper, mm -hmm. as he sat at the table, okay. the woman came, maybe an alabaster flask, a very costly oil of spike nine. Okay. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. Okay, so as she as, as they were, were in the house of Simon the leper, the woman came and, you know, having an alabaster box, and she, uh, she, she broke it and all of that and put it on his head. Now we'll go back to Luke 7 mm -hmm. to continue with, the thing we're looking at, um, Luke 7, verse 36, right? verse 36, go on please. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and mm -hmm. he went to the Pharisee house okay. and sat down to eat. Verse 37. Okay, and sat down to eat, okay. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, mm -hmm. when he knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, mm -hmm. brought an alabaster flask of fragrant, fragrant oil. Now, this, this, now the, the reason why this is important is even though there are some things it said about the woman, again, back to our looking at the background and the settings, we need to now look at the second character, the second person who oh, came to the I scene. Just, maybe, maybe I want to stop you before you okay, go. Okay, please go on. That verse 36, verse, I just direct this, you're just striking that this man, this Pharisee, invited mm -hmm. Jesus to eat. So mm -hmm. we see Jesus responding for a meal invitation. So the man of God, the savior <laughs> of the world, so this was clear, and every of those things for some people that really they are too so more spiritual than Jesus. Yeah. Really, for a meal invitation, they mm. feel like no, there's nothing. Or these people even hide in things like this. So mm. those ones that feel like oh, they are doing more serious. They there's a portray, there's a portrait they have for the mm. public portrayal and every of those things. So they can't be found with any of this kind of thing. Mm. Or when they get to do this, when they do it hiding, there's the hypocrisy of eating. Yeah. Dainty meal because you kind of know this is a this must be like a for dining a fine well, dining this, this, setup this. they were coming so it's not just yeah you know, of just for just food to just satisfy one guy anyhow and every other thing it was not this kind of meal that Jesus had when he was at the well waiting mm. for food to be brought anyhow so mm. this was a proper former dainty invitation mm. and Jesus honored this. Mm. So really, we need to understand that the people who the spirituality are not to live supernaturally, naturally. Exactly. Jesus honored mm. this. And then again, to send a note of warning that I feel like some people will say like, Jesus will have honored it and said, he was just going to use it to go and preach the gospel. But he said, mm. and he, was asked, he asked him to eat, and he went to the Pharisee and he sat down to eat. Mm -hmm. So this was a food invitation, dining invitation, and Jesus honored it to eat mm -hmm. there. Mm. So really, it's to, uh, to tell us and inform us as we uh, do our work, our physical work on this side of the earth, to have this uh, this normal, healthy relationship mm. with invitation, we even with meal. Yeah, well, well, this is an important thing you've actually pointed our attention to. Yeah. The fact is, even Jesus' life, his ministry, uh, you know, <clears throat> in the flesh, uh, at least paints a picture for us of how God thinks. Do we say to you that uh, the scripture clearly says that nobody has seen God at any time mm -hmm. in the book of John, but the son of man who came from his side has yeah. declared him. What that means is he, he is the expression of the nature, the mindset of how God thinks, how God feels about every situation. We'll have been kept in the dark, if not that we're yeah. looking at Jesus. He is the expression, the scriptures is the expression of God's image, the yeah. fullness of the expression of what? Of the image of the Father. That's why he told Philip, when Philip says, show us the, the Father, Father, he said, so if you have seen us, me, have you have Father. seen the Father. If you want to know how God looks like, how God thinks of you, how God relates to us, look at me. I am the fullness of the expression of the image of the Father. Hebrews chapter 1 also tells us, it says, God at sundry times and diverse manners at diverse times has spoken to us through the prophet. But in these last days, he has now finally spoken to us. He has fully now expressed himself through what? 
the Son. The epistles also says, in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. It means not just some parts, not some aspects of God, the fullness of what God is and what his nature is fully dwells in him. And that's the challenge that those who are natural Israelites have because all they have from their own Torah, all they have from all the books, you know, the Genesis, Exodus, and all these books that they still hang on to today, for those who are not saved among them, is they only have aspects, you know, a bit here and there of the nature, the person of God. There's a lot of confusion at the picture of what he is, what it feels like. Because if they still reject Jesus, who is the fullness of the expression of God, he may be a missing out on the completeness of what God looks and thinks like. Why I've gone to all that explanation is to show you that Jesus in the flesh characterizes the fullness of the expression of God's image and what God thinks. How do you see him? Do you see Jesus? Well, it doesn't matter whether you're a Pharisee, whether you are rich, it doesn't matter whether you are poor, he was able and he did relate completely and totally with what with everyone. You will see him, he will go to the house of, uh, uh, you know, to have a feast, and it's the same one that we choose to identify with a woman that was about to be stoned by the Pharisees. You know, those who are down and out, he will identify with them, and those who are high up there, as long as they are not filled with their own pride, he is ready to what? identify with them. It doesn't seem to say, you know what, let's be focused on this particular group so we can prove a point. He was able to switch in. You know, you know, this is quite amazing. It's the gospel for all nations. That's why God forbid that we restrict the application of the gospel to a particular context, a particular group of people, yeah. or a particular class yeah. of people. There are those today, there are gospels for a particular class. In fact, when somebody says God has called me to preach to a particular class of people or to raise a particular set of people, and they say, what kind of gospel is that that can only be applied to people in a particular situation? It doesn't apply to people in all that situation. There are those people whose gospel is only applicable to a particular race. It doesn't have whatever they are preaching, you can't apply it to another race. Something is wrong with that kind of gospel. Jesus was able, whether you were a Pharisee that you were rich, because a Pharisee is most likely a rich person. Whether you're a Pharisee that you're popular, it will come to feast in your house. Or whether you are somebody like the woman caught in the adultery, he is able to stay right there with you. Yeah, Nothing. It, it, it yeah. doesn't, it, it doesn't, you know, it, he's right there as long as you're willing to give him room. He's coming right there for you. And that's the gospel. That's what it typifies. It shows us how God relates, what with the nature of God, how he perceives us. Yeah. And that's what we see, you know, right there. There are those that want to identify with the poor and push away the rich. You know, there are some gospels like that. They only identify with the poor and push away the rich. Others, the other way around, identify with the rich and push away the poor, saying that the rich are the ones that have, they are quality people and they don't have a room for the poor. That's why the book of James says, we dare not owe the faith of our Lord Jesus with Christ the with the respect of persons. persons. Because it's not pure faith. It, there's a yeah. pure faith undefiled. Uh, pure a, religion, the pure religion. religion or pure faith undefiled has to be the one that we allow Jesus to stem through us without being yeah. colored by our own, you know, uh, prejudice, our own idiosyncrasies, yeah. our own personal, what, you know, uh, ideologies that we grew up with or whatever it is that we don't allow our gospel to be colored with any of such. Yeah, Jesus. We don't bring our own nativism. Jesus. Jesus was the epitome of that. Yeah. It's whether a line you, of him. That it, is it. That's it. The line of Christ, you, whether you're rich or poor, there's room so for you. Access for everyone. Yeah, there's room for you. The only thing that can push me anyway is pride and self righteousness. Yeah. So whether you are rich or not, as long as you are not full of pride and self righteousness, there's room for you. Yeah. Though we may want to say the rich and the, those who are out there have a higher tendency for self righteousness than those who are down. It doesn't mean that those who are down don't have it. People can take pride in their poverty. Yeah. And take pride in their pride in their own situation. We're not yeah. saying that. It just seems to be that those who have made it or those who are successful have a higher chance of saying the reason why I made it was because of this asset Trusting ability. Yeah, yeah, they are more likely to trust it. That's why Apostle Paul did say in the epistles that look at your calling, brethren. Not many yeah. are rich, not many are wise. Some are, Some are not, not many. Not all. Yeah. yeah, so there's a higher tendency among the wise, the rich, and the successful to be more full of pride. Yeah, and they exclude them. They exclude they, themselves. Yeah, yeah, more. But it doesn't mean that there are not those among them who are not full of pride, 
who are willing to humble themselves. Like this Simon the father, this, this Simon the leper. Give him, continue or give him some grace. Yeah, Joseph, Arimathea, he yeah. was able to invite Jesus, even though if we say, if we say he was a leper before, and because of the fact that he knew what it means to be ostracized, mm -hmm. and he knew what it means to be brought back into the fold, and that broke him to some extent, where he was able to damn the consequence and invite Jesus, even though he was a Pharisee. Even if we say things like that, we must still acknowledge, acknowledge that it takes a level of uh, not being, uh, of dealing with his own self-righteousness and his own pride for him to bring Jesus. Now, it's even a positive reflection for him, a positive point for him there, mm -hmm. because some people, out of fear of what they are suffering again, they will run away. They do not want to, you know, mm -hmm. it can, it can mm -hmm. work in both ways because it of can. the leprosy yeah. experience that they have. They are afraid of that alienation. They will do everything. Mm. They don't want a repeat of that. So really, it's not people cannot say because of the experience, this is going to be the reaction. That they experience leprosy, it does not mean that they're going to respond like Simon here in inviting Jesus. So the, the fear of it will be so much exaggerated, and they don't want to do anything that might risk them alienation. Being ostracized and, by the other Pharisees. And those so some mm. people that are coming mm. away from poverty, they will not want to do anything to embrace the poverty of Christ and because they really, they fear ah, of it. So we have, to give it to, we have to give it to him mm. that he was able to damn. It's not like natural thing and that is why we have to rely fully on the, the power of the gospel to change. Mm. And that is why people cannot just say, yes, I can, based on my experience, I can have a positive response and outlook. So we cannot use, we cannot say affliction can train people into righteousness. Oh, of course. So that is why we have to, people who believe in and feel like they can subject themselves to a particular experience, they can grow from it and get the growth, spiritual growth from it. It is only the power of God's school that is just the transformative, transformative power to change. <laughs> Negative oh, wow. experience cannot make you to react you know, and say, now nah, you have passion for the poor because you were once poor and become rich. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. You know, some people, uh, politically speaking, there are those that campaign using that yeah. as a yes uh, as a, background, as, yeah. a, as a point for why you should vote for them. Yeah. In the political, we've always seen that it always in, in the political sphere, yeah. they would say, you know what, I, I, know, had, I know I what it means. This. I don't have this. I know what it means to be not just poor. You know, I was Down and out, so those totally and completely poor. And uh, you would think if such a person was given the the, the office, the platform, yeah. they would know how to relate and treat the poor. Yeah. Because they were once like that. But evidence has shown yeah. over that over some again. of them are probably the worst kind of leaders ever. In yeah. fact, if there are those yeah, up for the poor then, there yeah. are those that will choose their leader based on skin color. They said we're a minority group in this country. Yeah. And for the first time we have a leader who has the same skin as us. And we're a minority. And they say, you know, we've seen this happen. It's history is repeated. So they say we're gonna vote for this person. Yeah. Uh, because at least he, 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 he has his race is for the minority race, minority race, and we've seen that and happen when, when such people get to power. In fact, in most cases, their people are probably the worst treated. Worse off. <laughs> they are even worse off, yeah. even though he came out of the minority group. So really, so the the bottom line is it's the gospel that has the first nothing. Power. None of those so things we cannot could. bank mm. on our experiences. Mm. So today, because we have other pseudo religion, yeah. other pseudo gospels that want us to. Some today they tell you to go and recreate those kind of experiences. Yeah. So with all those gurus and everybody say they feel like you can bring something out. There is a transformation, transformative power locking in those experiences. So people go and again, and some people will go and subject themselves into those kind of things, thinking they can learn humility mm -hmm. so they come better out. So it's only the power of the gospel that changes. Exactly. People. So we really need to yield ourselves fully yeah. to the full effect of the gospel. Let the Lord have His full work. Let the kids have his perfect work in us. Yeah, you know, thank you for that. You know, even Jesus in his parable, in one of the parables, he actually alluded to that fact that human circumstances and human experiences mm. may not be able to do yeah. the work it's, of God in our hearts. The spirit that, <laughs> that the in fact, he gave it nothing. nothing in his parable about the man who was forgiven his yeah. debt. You know, the man was forgiven his debt. Much, and much, then a much, much it, it surprised us that when his other servant hold him, hold him less than what he less than what master. he hold his own master, he wasn't able to forgive that one his debt, yeah. even though he was forgiven his debt. That is not proof yeah. that human experience may not be able to work righteousness yeah, in so the heart of man. because he, he had an experience of being forgiven, forgiven yeah. but he couldn't extend it 
so it's possible to come out of poverty into richness, or it's possible to come out of obscurity to notoriety, and yet treat other people who are still in obscurity yeah. with disdain. So it's 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 not uncommon, and uh, we see that happen. So um, that's why we need to expose ourselves to the light of the gospel, to the power of the gospel. That's the only thing that can transform. That's the only thing that can recreate. You know, that's the only thing that can bring out a new person. That's why the Bible says, except a man be born again. That's it. It takes the power of the gospel to bring newness out of death. Yeah. Uh, and that's what the gospel we're exposing you to right now, the word of life. So we'll go back to our Luke chapter uh, 7. Yes, verse yeah, so we're going back verse to 37. verse 37. And behold, the woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus was a Now, there, there's a word of uh, <clears throat> who was a sinner. a sinner, because you know you need to take these things apart. <laughs> who was a sinner? Now, there's, there are lots of theories uh, that uh, theologians have, and some of us, we tend to look at it as well. Why in the world will they call her a sinner? There are characterizations in the gospel. Even if you look at the gospels, you would notice that in Luke chapter 18, when Jesus was talking about the parable of prayer with importunity, yeah. if you go later on in that chapter 18, I think uh, much more down that chapter, he began to refer to two people who went to the temple to pray. Yeah. You know, one of them, he called him the Pharisee uh, a the Pharisee. Sinner. The other one, they called him a publican. Mm -hmm. Some other version called him a the sinner. sinner. Why this? characterizations in the gospel. Now, you have to understand where the writers are coming from. I'm talking about when I say uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John who documented these things. Uh, you know, if you look at Luke 15, Luke 15, the parable of the lost son or the yeah. two sons that were lost. Uh, if you notice, before Jesus began to speak that parable, prior to that time, the Bible said the audience were the Pharisees and the sinners. The publicans. So you will see this distinguishing factor, the character characterizations, because there is a very superficial way to look at it, and there is a deep way to look at it. Superficially, you may think is the scripture pointing out the fact that the Pharisees were not sinners. Why call these other group the sinners? And call the other guys the what? The Pharisees. We know that's not true. Jesus called the Pharisees out for their sins. Yes, he called them out for their sins. He told them the things they used to do, that they would, uh, you know, they would go to widows' houses, they would devour widows' houses, yeah. and then make long prayers as a cover-up. That's hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a sin. He also mentioned the fact that, you know, uh, the, the, the things they do, they would go and make a proselyte and make the person twice a son of what? Hell. Yeah, so those yeah. writers were living in hell. So... If that's true, that they were sinners in need of the gospel, in John 8, Jesus said they needed the gospel. He said, because you guys claim that you now see, mm -hmm. now you are blind. Yeah. If you are admitted your blindness, you will have been able to receive light so you can what? See. So you can see. So at least Jesus was pointing out the fact that they needed the gospel. They needed salvation. But if that's the case, why this the, the distinguishing thing between the Pharisees and called the other party what? Sinners, if the Pharisees also were what? Sinners. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is it, it was being written that way to show you how the Pharisees think about those people. It was not God's perspective. As far as God is concerned, Romans 3, Romans 6 is for God has concluded all men under sin. Romans 6, 23, all have sinned and yeah, come short. Of, the, it's not that there are sinners and there are Pharisees. Everybody have come short of the glory of God. So the only reason why the scripture always documents in the gospel that these are sinners and these are what Pharisees is to use the language, uh, the terminology that the Pharisees were fond of using in their own self-righteousness, where they say, this one is not part of the holy group. This one is not part of those of us who are following the strict religious doctrines, you know, uh, of Moses. These guys are not part of the inner caucus, and therefore they are outcast, they are sinners. They are unclean, they are unholy. So it was just their language that's being used. You know, that's why you see the scripture saying this is a, these are sinners and these are Pharisees. So we even saw <laughs> the Pharisees making that reference. So yeah, they do. Call them and say that he was eating with sinners. <laughs> it was exactly. He was eating with sinners. So he was, yeah, yeah. They accused him of eating with sinners. So they actually um, categorized some people as sinners. Exactly. It was the, it was the Pharisees' categorization, language, not yeah. Jesus' categorization, not God's categorization. It was their language. And the only reason they use that for people are those who are not following the rules and the guidance and regulations of the laws of Moses. 
As long as you're there, not even talking about people, the, the righteousness of God being imputed or imparted to you. It's just about following the dogmas, the rules. If you're not part of that group, you are a sinner, you are an outcast. That's what they tend to use. So be careful. Now, the reason why we said that there are those that think that the reason why this scripture called this man what? A sinner, it has to be because our lifestyle is so completely bad. She was living a life full of what? Of sin actively, and that's why she was called a sinner. It doesn't really mean anything. It just it's just a category. You want to say one or two? Yes, things? I just like so we were talking, and I was just believing that the apostolic correction is going forth as we minister today, mm -hmm. and they're rooting out all the all the leaven and the seed of the Pharisee mm -hmm. because their leaven is they are the one good as we have uh, as in <laughs> They call themselves good in the good that characterization of people are seeing us deny nation. They are the one that do, does all this classism. So today, if you see people responding in that way in which they are categorizing even saints among the quality <laughs> and not quality, the accepted, you wow. know, the, the outcast and every of those things, the desirable, the undesirable, mm. the people that call themselves the anointed and the people not anointed because this is it. They are calling themselves holy and the others are sinner. So even among the saints, you will feel like these are a you know, special class, these are special breed. So mm. that's the seed, that's the living of the Pharisee. Mm. Today we pray that the, the, the word of the, the Lord Pharisees. is going Pouring forth is mm. refining us and refining us, taking away all this seed, those elements of classism, because mm. that's the root, that's the, the underwork of the Pharisee. Well, thank you, because the implication of such characterizations and categorization is that it has a tendency of subtracting us from receiving grace and mercy. Yeah. In that evil Luke 18, in that parable, when Jesus, Jesus said asked, the two of them, one of them is a sinner, the other one was what? A Pharisee. Again, that was not God's language. That is their language. Now, he said, one said, you know, I pray, you know, I fast three times weekly. You know, I pray and I give my tithes, my offerings, and I do all the things right. And that's why he was called a Pharisee. The other person doesn't do all those things what, right. The other person has not crossed the T's and dotted the I's. As they call the person what, a sinner. But eventually, the fact is, this one that was called a sinner, he prayed and said, Lord, have mercy Amen. upon me a sinner that's that's just the word uh that's the thing the mercy of god throwing oneself at the mercy of god but the other person who was the pharisee didn't see any need to throw himself yes, at the mercy, mercy yeah. of god and mercy. that is exactly what we talked about just when we started today's transmission that for those who actually learn the ropes the principles the guidelines there's a tendency not to often fall back on the mercy of God. Yeah. That after you have done everything, yeah, all, all, all the light I have received, all the light of God's word I have received concerning my life, my future, concerning how to order my family right, concerning my finances, concerning my morality, I have lived my life, I've tried as much by grace to walk in the light I have received, but Father, ultimately, I threw myself at That's your mercy. There is that weakness not to do so, especially if you are the one following the light you have received. If you are the one not taking following chances, the following the rules, living, when we say following the rules, let's even take it beyond the Pharisee. Let's bring it into the context of the Christian faith that you are following the word that you have received. You are living your life. You are not the one that is slack. You are not just mm -hmm. no sloppy living for you. You are not just taking life, you know, like you are not taking chances. You are making sure you are applying the word of God yeah. that you have received to your life. You are doing that. Don't ever forget to consistently throw yourself at the mercy of God, in spite of you walking in the light that you have received, yeah. you no, must. Fully, that is the thing that can help you to keep your head. You down. must maintain that, that balance because of knowing always that you are just a responder anyway. Exactly. So by the time things happen, by so the time what you are doing, it yes. must come out the out of, out of the understanding that you are just responding. Exactly. You are not the actor. You are not the initiator. Exactly. So all those rules that you are for, for walking in the light of God's word and everything is giving exactly. a response exactly. to an actor. Exactly. So exactly. So that keeps your head down. That, that keeps, keeps your head, head down. down yes. So by the time you start producing results or the wisdom that God has given you is being justified by our children and you are getting this, you will never at any time take pride in the rightness yeah. of your belief. You only take pride in the fact that what a God of mercy, God of gracious yeah, God I saw, who has shown me all mercy, who has shown me all mercy. That will, that, that will be what will come out of your mouth and people around you who are listening to you, they will be able to benefit of that grace. They are not hearing you pushing them down. 
They're not hearing you say, you know what? The reason oh, why you guys are yourself, still down. Promoting yourself. Yeah, you are seeing Christ. <laughs> yes. You are seeing that you are giving the reference, mm. the attention to the Lord, to the initiator, to the originator. Yes. The, the originator of your faith. Even whatever faith you claim to have now. Exactly. I have faith for this. You say, who is the origin of your faith? Exactly. The author of that faith, mm. the captain of that salvation, the mm. one that called you to that ship. Mm. So really, you cannot make any of any boast beyond mm. that, that I was a captain for my soul. Mm. The captain for my faith, for my mm. salvation. So whatever you always, the reference will always see. When we hear you, when people come, they are not hearing you. They are seeing the reference to the originator, mm. to the initiator. Exactly. So that when people come around you, it, you see, what amazes us, and I wanted to consider this, concerning Jesus, the scripture says there was no guy found in his mouth. Mm -hmm. Now think about it. Think about it. There was no guy found in his mouth. Uh, you know, he too had a testimony. The Lord said, the prince of this world comes, yeah. and there was nothing in me that he could hold on to. Yeah. It means, let's look at his life in the flesh. There was nothing, nothing that people could say, this is what is wrong. This was a deception and hypocrisy. This was a lie, or this was something that was, you know, not right. There was nothing. In fact, he said he did not come to break the law. He came to what? Fulfill it. It means he lived exactly he fulfilled every requirement and demands of the law of Moses. That's really hard thing to do. Because even the Pharisees fell short of it. So he upheld every guidance, instruction, rules, regulations that were demanded by the law of Moses. That's why it became the end of righteousness for us. Yeah. Because he fulfilled the righteous demands of the law on our behalf. Yeah. And for him to do that, he fulfilled it. It means, fulfilled there. please don't rush over that word. It means everything the do's and the don'ts that the law of Moses requires, he fulfilled everything. He ticked the boxes. Now, for such a man who lives such an exemplary life in the flesh, uh, is it not strange that the sinners, those who were caught in adultery, those who were those who were down, those who were out, those who couldn't fulfill the moral law, who couldn't follow the moral code, they find him attractive and fascinating to come around him? Because if in our days, if somebody can live such a life that is above board, naturally speaking, now, there's a higher tendency, such a person can say, look at you. The reason why you are down there, the reason why things are not happening for you yeah. is because you have not learned this principle. Look at me. Yeah. Look at me. Look at what? Look Look at what the rules. Look at the principles I'm living by. Look at the results I'm producing. See why. See you. Look at you. Such and that is why the, such Christian faith is obnoxious to the down and the out. That's why it's only people that can at least fulfill those kind of demands that come out, out, around those people. They, you, they can't because attract. They, get intimidated. they can't attract those who are unable or incapable. They can't attract such. But how was Jesus able to attract such? Because today, the reason why some attract, attract such is that they also have weaknesses. They also say, you know what? They can mm, identify themselves. Uh, yeah, we can identify. You know, I too, I lie once in a while. Okay, I understand. It, you know, this is it. This is the kind that humans understand. We can understand why we can relate. Because we say, you know, I was once like that. I was like that yeah, before. Can relate to that. I can relate with that. Or there are those who are eye sounding, who are living eye up there. And you see them, they use that as a means to push down others and to tell others that's why your life is the way it is. How come Jesus was able to live a life above board? Not a guy found in his mouth. Not anything that you could hold against him morally. In terms of money, in terms of relationships, you couldn't hold anything against him. You see, you know, he, he lived a life above board. Yet, he attracted sinners. He attracted those who don't have the ability. Yeah. Those who are down. Those who are oppressed. Those who are weak. Those who can't even fulfill any moral law, those who are, he still attracted even them. Even the ones that the sinner calls sinners, they are yes. the ones that they see is, there are some sins that they feel is outrageous, that he needs thrown in and everything. Yeah. You see Jesus identify with this Extending kind of grace to her. Yeah. Some people extend grace if they were also, you know. Oh, it wasn't that, <laughs> uh, that ah, bad. It's, yeah. it's amazing. It's amazing. And this is what the scripture says we have not so learned Christ. We have to learn Christ. We have to learn Christ. It means throwing ourselves at the mercy of God in spite of the fact that we are living by the light that we have received. And that's what we see there. Yeah, and that is where we are going to draw the curtain today. As we see, you're still on this uh, the woman with the alabaster bush. Mm. We believe the Lord has spoken to you. You are hearing God as we minister. Mm. And we do hope that you are going to join us next time as we continue in this series. We're, we're still looking at the, the, the woman. 
why she was called a sinner and all that, that's why we're still looking.